You're listening to the Go and Tell Gals podcast, and I'm your host, Jess Conley. In most of our episodes, we'll have a guest, a woman who is running on mission right where she's at. We pray this podcast leaves you encouraged and spurred on to go and tell the good news right where you're at. At the beginning of the year, I put out a podcast about the idea of agreement. This concept that we can spend our days and our lives and our actions agreeing with who God has made us to be and that that may help us stop striving and trying to be someone we're not or trying to be a better version of ourselves. That podcast resonated with a lot of you and we also put out a guide called 21 Days of Agreement. You can download that for free at jessconnolly.com backslash agreement. And I also walked with a group of women through the 21 Days of Agreement. We called it an agreement group. And with this group, we've been taking small snippets of God's word every day and reading it and applying it to our lives and taking some time to agree with these truths that God has spoken over us. And one thing we've been talking about in our agreement group is the idea of having a language of agreement. Essentially, what I mean when I talk about having a language of agreement is using words, using phrases, using our voices to speak this idea of agreement out loud over us and also to speak it out loud over the people around us. And so I wanted to share a little bit about what I've been learning about a language of agreement. And first, even though it's near the end of January, I want to go back to Christmas. I want to go back to the story of Jesus's birth, because one of my favorite stories about a language of agreement is found in Luke 1 at the birth of Jesus. Here's what happens in Luke 1 verse 26. The angel Gabriel comes to Mary and says, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, what we find out is that Mary was terrified at this pronouncement from an angel. And that is consistent with what we've seen through the rest of scripture, that anytime someone encounters an angel, they're totally freaked out, which I get because heavenly beings showing up on earth is crazy. It's strange, it's wonderful, and it's awe-inspiring, but it's also terrifying. And we find that Mary is not just greatly troubled at the angel, but also at his words and also at his news. And we can get this, right? Because culturally, this is a crazy idea. We've had thousands of years to get used to the idea of a virgin birth and Mary miraculously carrying this son, Jesus. But this was news to her. This wasn't a story she had grown up with. And moreover, it was her life that was going to be interrupted in a crazy and confounding way. People were going to doubt her. People were going to cast shadows over her. This was going to change the trajectory of her life, change her story. And it may change how she was accepted culturally. So Mary is a little scared. But the angel says all of this to her and speaks all this blessing and excitement and joy over what is going to come. And at the end of it, Mary says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left. I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. I can hear the obedient resignation in that phrase. Okay, if that's the way it's going to be, thank you. I will do that. Okay. That's how that sounds to me. That's how it reads to me. But what we find as Luke goes on is that Mary immediately goes from there to see her cousin Elizabeth, who is miraculously pregnant with John the Baptist. And what we find is that Mary encounters a sister, a cousin, a relative, a friend who is going to speak some language over her, who is going to speak some agreement with what God is doing. And it changes everything. Here's what happens. Luke 1 39. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is she who has believed what the Lord has said to her will be accomplished. 
What happens next in scripture is a handful of verses marked in the middle of a very important recounting where what we're given is a transcript of Mary's entire mind shift changing. Luke 1, 46. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He has brought down rulers from their thoughts thrones, but he has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. See what happens when one woman comes to another woman and speaks agreement. I believe that this is what God is doing in your life and you are so blessed for it is that that woman goes from saying, I'm the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. She moves from obedient resignation into hopeful, expectant preaching. Everything changes. I believe that becoming a woman of agreement has so much to do with our language. And I wanna share just a few ways that I'm learning right now how to partner with agreement and how to change my language so God can change me and the world around me. Here's the first thing. A few years ago, my friend said, you know why books are so important? You know why it's so important that you keep writing books? Because when you change the language, you change the culture. And I want to encourage you right now, no matter what your culture is like, if your friend group or your family or the people that you spend time with, if it's a toxic culture, if it's a discouraging culture, when you change the language bit by bit, the culture does change. And sometimes that starts with us being intentional with our words. And secondly, I want to encourage you with this truth. If you feel like you're not a life speaker, if you feel like you don't have it in you to speak encouragement, to speak agreement over yourself and over the people around you, I want to remind you that you're made in the image of God and you're given his native language. I believe that God's native language is life. And we see this at the very beginning of Genesis that he says, let there be, let there be. He made, he created. God builds things with words. And I believe that he's given us the same power to speak life, to speak hope, to speak healing, to speak encouragement over ourselves, over our homes, over our relationships, over our children. I believe that everything shifts when one friend looks at another and says, I believe that God's got this in your life. Or when she says, I see that he's mighty in you. I can see him working. Let's start with some things that we can watch. If we wanna be cautious and careful about our language and make sure that it's speaking life and agreement and not discouragement and death. Here are a few things I am watching in my own life. I'm watching limiting language. Anytime I say, I can't, she won't, this will not. Sometimes I find that I speak with limiting language in places where God has not spoken. And I think we can pause right now and ask God to give us ears to hear when we use limiting language. Our God doesn't have limits. He can go where he wants. He can start what he wants. He can end what he wants. He can bring things back to life if he chooses. He isn't limited and I don't want to limit him either with the words I put on myself or on others. I think we can watch our defeated language. It's over. This is awful. This was a horrible decision. The truth is, we don't really know when something is totally finished or done or good or bad. God can always be bringing good out of it and something that may look good to us may be filled with negative consequences that we just can't see yet. So why speak defeat over things that God may not have spoken defeat over? Why not speak hope and victory into those places? I think that we can watch isolating language You don't understand me. No one gets me. I'll always be alone. I'm on my own team and no one else is here. 
are there phrases like that that you've spoken over yourself or over your feelings or over your mindset? And have you limited even the possibility of God being with you, of God understanding you, of God having compassion for you? Just because you've said it has not meant that he's not with you, but it may have changed the way that you thought about a particular situation. You may have felt more isolated because you spoke that you were isolated when really you weren't. I'm noticing that I need to put an immediate ban on all negative self-talk. I'm so dumb. I'm so fat. I can't do anything right. I'm an idiot. I mess up at everything. Oh man, what's wrong with me? These are things that have had to be eradicated from my vocabulary immediately. I've had to ask the Holy Spirit for a quickening so that if the phrase starts to come to my mouth, that I would almost feel sick about saying it. And here's the thing. I think that we should put an immediate ban on negative talk about anyone, about any other humans. But I find that we often have to start with ourselves because sometimes we're willing to speak a lot nicer about other people than we will about ourselves. But just decide that you want to have a language of agreement and not a language of disagreement that speaks death or discouragement or brokenness or negativity over yourself or anyone else. Hey friends, we're going to break right here for a second and I want to just share something quickly with you. A theme for me this year, I sense God taking me back to Psalm 18 and this idea that he has brought me out to a spacious place. And I want to live under the belief that he's brought me out to a spacious place. One thing I love about our partnership with West Rock Coffee is that they want to provide a spacious place for their coffee growers. They want them to feel encouraged. They want them to feel equipped. They want them to be given the tools they need to live abundantly and also to do their jobs unto the glory of God and change the world while they're at it. West Rock Coffee believes in people and not just the drive to survive, but to live with dignity and to achieve greatness and to experience abundance right where they are. You've heard me talk about West Rock, how I love how they partner with individual farmers and what they're doing in the world, but I just wanted to put that on the table today that I think part of living a spacious life for me, part of living a life where I believe God can move and can do things and can grow and can shift me is partnering with companies where I see the leaders of those companies doing the same thing and not just for themselves, but for their employees and for their customers as well. That's why I love West Rock because they are about abundance. They are about providing great opportunities and they are down to change the world one cup of coffee at a time. You can get West Rock Coffee on my favorite place, amazon.com. Here's the thing, if any of that is discouraging for you, I get it, me too. Some of it's really discouraging for me because this is language that I find often in my life. But in the name of Jesus, let's go to God and ask that conviction to not turn into condemnation against us, but to compel us to more life-giving language. So let's say you're watching the negative language. What words can you put in to have a language of agreement that agrees not just with who God has made you to be, but a language that agrees with who God has made others to be? Here's what I find. Hope. Put in hope, more than positivity, put in hope. Believe that nothing is dead, nothing is past his reach, nothing is too far gone and say so. Speak hope, speak praise, give him credit. If you're having a good hair day, if you found the money you needed, if your friend's cold went away, if your friend's cancer went away, put praise on your lips and tell him you're thankful. See how many times a day you can say thanks, God, and just give him credit where it's due. Put praise on your lips. I believe we can use a language of grace, telling people they're off the hook, reminding them that he covers them, that it's his character and his competency that makes up when our weakness comes in hot. Speak grace. Tell people they're off the hook. Tell them that you forgive them. Tell yourself you're off the hook. Remind yourself that he's forgiven you. And I would encourage you to speak promises over yourself and your people. If you don't know where to start with the promises of God, go to Google and enter promises of God. 
And you will find so many entries. And then I would encourage you to begin to speak those promises over yourself. Isaiah 40, 29, he gives strength to the weary. Say, I'm tired today, but he gives strength to the weary. Isaiah 54, 17, say, no weapon formed against me will prosper. I have a headache. This bill came in that I wasn't expecting. This friend is upset with me, but I believe that no weapon formed against me will prosper. I believe that no thing the enemy is trying to use in my life to separate me from God will work. I'm going to agree agree that God is going to come in and move and shift me and change me. James 1 5 say, I believe he'll give me wisdom. You might feel confused. You might need direction, but speak the hope and belief that he promises he'll give you what you need. John 8 36. If the son has set you free, you are free indeed. Speak the truth and belief of that freedom over your life. I wonder what it would look like today if we just tried to put in a little more increase and agreement language and just ask God to help us watch the limiting and defeated language that sometimes just sneaks in. Here's what I know. Our life is made up of words, and that's a good thing. The words we say often change our day and change others' days. The words we say define how we feel about things and how we see them. And this is great news because we can control our words. We can control what comes out of our mouth. So here's my encouragement to you. Try to partner with agreement language and see what shifts. See how your viewpoint changes and see how your day changes. You are life speakers. This is what you were made to do. This is what we were made to do. We are women of agreement. We can have a language of agreement. In Jesus' name. 